So my name is Calvin Neufeld, this is my website, uh, and uh, we are, well, actually first I should say that today is my five year wedding anniversary. Yeah. So happy anniversary, Sharon, I love you very much. Um, and the, the last song I played actually, the You Light Up My, my Life, is one of our songs. And um, I think it's kind of relevant today, isn't it? About celebrating the pride of who you are and who you love, because it does light up your life. And uh, if somebody comes into your life who lights up your life, it can't be wrong if it feels so right. Uh, but today we are here to learn a little bit and to explore the what I call the LGBTQQ2SAA labyrinth. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of intimidating. Even the word itself is the acronym itself is intimidating. And I've actually seen acronyms that are way long, like way 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 long, with all kinds of extra letters that you didn't even know existed in the alphabet. Uh, but this is what I, uh, in my experience, one of the most commonly used long-form acronyms uh, for, to represent sexual and gender diversity. So I'm going to use this one, we can walk through it, but even this doesn't represent everybody, so bear that in mind. We're just going to try to go in a nutshell through each of these here. Uh, so, uh, I've just sort of laid it out, we're, not gonna, we're, we're gonna go into each one, one by one. So, but for now, just to give you a snapshot of what it is that we're talking about here. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, intersex, queer, questioning, two-spirit, asexual, and allies. Um, and I have just, for visual references, separated them by color to distinguish between the ones that represent sexual orientation in the blue, uh, the ones that represent gender identity in the green, and the ones that could be either represent either or both or neither. Uh, but you'll understand why. And just very quickly before we go into it, um, I just want to make it very clear the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity. Sexual orientation is who you are uh, physically and emotionally attracted to. Um, gender identity is your sense of self. So if, if you are transgender, for example, that doesn't make you gay. You know, they're, they're totally distinct things. And you can have a gay trans person, or you can have a straight trans person, or anything like that. Sexual orientation is totally uh, independent of uh, gender identity. So to make that very, very clear. So before we go into this acronym, uh, I just there are, there are two groups of people that I find are so often so often left out of the big picture of sexual and gender diversity altogether, and they're such enormous groups that I think it's a shame that they're left out. So I'm adding them in. First, heterosexuals. You may have encountered some <laughs> quite a large group, and secondly, uh, cisgender people. And that would be the gender identity counterpart of a heterosexual. So we'll go into that. I won't, I won't go into that just yet. But I don't think we should leave them out if we are to take a look at the big picture of sexual and gender diversity altogether. So we begin with uh, heterosexuals. And that would be, in case you don't know, uh, a man who is physically and emotionally attracted to women or a woman who is physically and emotionally attracted to men as represented here very artistically. <laughs> then we have lesbian, and that would be a woman who is physically and emotionally attracted to women. Nice and simple. Then we have gay, that would be a man who is physically and emotionally attracted to men. Now, it gets a little more complicated as we go, but let's just go through each one. Bisexual. That would be either a woman who is physically and emotionally attracted to both men and women, or a man who is physically and emotionally attracted to both men and women. And I, I should make it very clear here that representing that artistically was a real challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to give the impression, because this is one of the negative stereotypes about bisexual people, that they can't be monogamous, or that they have all kinds of relationships, or they just can't make up their minds or anything like that. So how, this isn't meant to represent, um, you know, uh, that they're not uh, just as monogamous, or just as not monogamous as any other type of sexual orientation. It's just a visual reference here. Um, and before I go into the gender identities there, into the T's, I'm going to skip to this A, since that's the last of the sexual orientations. So I want to look at them all together here. Watch very closely. Asexual. And an asexual is a person who doesn't experience sexual attraction. So while a bisexual or, or uh, 
gay or a lesbian, would be physically and emotionally attracted, and asexual would only be emotionally attracted. The physical attraction isn't there, so there's, there is, they don't experience sexual attraction. But that doesn't mean that they don't very much desire just as much uh, of uh, uh, intimacy and committed relationships. They may be single, they may be in relationships, could be with a man or with a woman, because what's between the legs doesn't actually matter. There isn't any sexual attraction. And, I, and just to represent it, in case you didn't catch it, uh, between bisexual and asexual, I've just taken out the, uh, the throbbing. <laughs> so, there's still the love and the intimacy and the emotional attraction. Now, we go to the T's. Transgender is one great big umbrella term. Uh, and that could include, this is anybody who crosses or transgresses gender boundaries. And it's very important before we go into it to, to uh, make it very clear that this is a self-identifying term. You don't go up to somebody and say, you're a transgender person. A person will go up to you and say, I am a transgender person. So a person could, for example, uh, dress in, you know, man dressing, women's dresses, or things like that. But if that person doesn't identify as transgender, you don't count them as transgender. So, self-identify. Uh, and that could include, as I just mentioned, cross-dressers. That would be uh, somebody, for example, a man who enjoys the experience of wearing uh, women's clothing. Uh, it, and it doesn't have to do necessarily with your gender identity. It could be done for fun, whatever it happens to be. The point being that you transgress those gender boundaries, or you cross those gender boundaries, for whatever reason, pleasure, for fun, or, or just a shocker, whatever it happens to be. There's all kinds of reasons. Uh, it could be drag queens or drag kings. A drag queen being uh, a man who dresses up uh, as a woman for performance purposes. This is a performance. Uh, and again, it may or may not have anything whatsoever to do with a person's gender identity or sexual orientation. And a drag king, by parallel, would be a woman who dresses up uh, as a man for performance purposes. And again, having little to, or nothing to do with their gender identity or sexual orientation. Or it could be, for example, a, a genderless person. Some people would identify as genderless, not necessarily having a sense of themselves as either male or female. And there could also be people who consider themselves to be bigendered, to have both male and female within them. Um, and there are other people who consider themselves perhaps genderqueer. There's all kinds. They might want to be pronouns like z and zir and here and things like that that combine the male and female pronouns. So, there's a whole kinds of people who just don't feel like they fit in the box that they were crammed into at birth, right? And all of these people could fall under the category of transgender if they self-identify that way. The other T is transsexual, which is also transgender. But transsexuals, that would be someone like me. Uh, why would this be? <laughs> Born female, uh, but I, I don't identify as female. I've, I've always felt male. Uh, so with a transsexual, there tends to be uh, an incongruity between your gender identity, your sense of yourself, uh, and the biological sex that you were assigned. And that's typically associated with a strong desire to, uh, to align your body with your sense of self through the use of hormones or surgeries, etc. So a transsexual person is a transgender person, but they're quite distinct as a group within the transgender umbrella. Then, oh yes, the cisgender. This, in case you don't recognize her, is Sharon, my wife. <laughs> she is an example of a cisgender person, and that is a person, unlike a transsexual, or it could also be cissexual, um, would be somebody whose sense of themselves matches the biological sex. Sharon was born a girl, and she is very obviously feels like a girl. Uh, and that is the majority of the population. So, but I don't think we should leave them out, if you ask me. <laughs> then we have intersex. And this is interesting because this is purely a physical condition. <coughs> but it's very important to not overlook uh, not just the, um, the variation that occurs in, in terms of sexual orientation and gender identities, but the variation that occurs in nature. Uh, many, many people are born with an intersex condition, which is uh, you are not able, uh, somebody who's not exclusively, biologically not exclusively male or not exclusively female. Um, so this, there are about, what's surprising is that we don't hear about this condition uh, that occurs as often as it does. The estimates are about 1 in 500 births have some form of an intersex condition. 
So the, this is part of the natural diversity that exists. And uh, there are uh, estimates uh, uh, at least 40 different intersex conditions that can occur. Um, and it's also referred to as disorders of sexual development, depending on what term you like to use. They used to be called hermaphrodites, which is totally uh, not a PC word to use anymore. That's out the window. But um, there are, there's a combination of male and female anatomy. And so I think that that's also important not to overlook because there is so much diversity that exists and we simply can't keep thinking of things as black and white the way that we once did. <coughs> And then the Q, queer. Uh, this term is very delicate still because there are many people for whom this was used very abusively, uh, particularly in the older generations, would have very negative associations. It was a word that was used very abusively, very violently against people who would have fallen under this acronym. But these days, there is a reclamation of the word that's occurring, and I'm glad that it is because it's a wonderful word. If it's not used abusively, it's a wonderful word. Because, you know, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, trans woman, trans man, intersex, asexual, pansexual, heterosexual, drag queen, gang, intercostal, two spirit, androgynous, witch, fan, fairy, dyke, you know, sometimes it's just easier to just say I'm queer. You know? Because <laughs> you could also be any combination of them. And how do you, how do you, it becomes harder and harder to box yourself into check, 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 check. So a lot of people, especially the generations to come, are reclaiming this word. And much in the same way I described it recently about, you know, when you have a toxic site and they have to remediate the land, right, in order to make it healthy again. And I think that that's what's happening with this word, it's a remediation of the word, to clean it up again, so that it can be used properly. And then, we have questioning, which would be people who just maybe need a little bit more time to figure things out. And two-spirit which is one of my favorite words, um, but it is traditionally a First Nations term, and every time that I've heard it taught, it has been made very, very clear that it is inappropriate for people who are not First Nations to use this term. Goodness knows these communities have had enough stolen from them and appropriated from them, that if they want the language to define them within their social and cultural context, I think that we should allow that. But I would like it because it, it means yeah, the housing of both a male and a female spirit. Which for someone like me, there is a, a, a bit of a male and female spirit within me. So I like the, what it describes. But it's also interesting that um, in First Nations culture, this isn't only used uh, to define uh, a trans person, like someone like me. This is used as an umbrella term for lesbian, gay, bisexual, or trans people. And so it, it, it gives you a sense of how, in different cultures, there are different ways to understand sexual and gender diversity. Within this culture, it is all under this umbrella of having elements of both the male and the female, whether it has to do with your sexual orientation or your gender identity or what have you. So I like that. There's real simplicity to that. Uh, but even though I can't use the term, I do like to nonetheless sometimes imagine myself at the top of the totem pole because traditionally, <laughs> Uh, Two-spirited people in First Nations culture have been revered, very much so, with having the privilege of seeing the world from two perspectives at once. Right? Um, now, then, of course, that has been affected by colonization and, and other influence, religious influences that have come in, but traditionally it has been a very revered status. Uh, so the asexuals now and into allies, which is everybody who would be a friend and a support uh, everyone who desires quality of life for everybody within this acronym. And that could be family, friends, teachers, you know, somebody you don't even know sitting next to you. could be an ally. And this is a very, very important group because without the ally factor, we would be very weak because there's only so many of us and sometimes it's hard to speak for yourself. Sometimes you do need people to speak for you, on behalf of you. And so the allies are a bridge between the queer community and people who just don't get it, right? And also, allies are, tend to be included in the acronym for many reasons, but one of the main reasons is that they're often subjected to much of the prejudice, the discrimination, uh, the rejection that, that people, that sexual and gender minorities experience. 
So there's many of the same experiences by being an ally. Or if your child comes out as a trans kid or something, then you have to come out to everyone you've ever known and that your child is now, you know, a boy instead of a girl and things like that. And it can be very, very hard. You have to find your own way to come out of the closet sometimes if somebody close to you comes out. So many of the same experiences. So we, very, we like to include allies within the, the, the broad picture here. And that would be, in a snapshot, right, the kind of diversity that exists. Like I say, there's lots and lots of people who, don't, who, who weren't represented in, in, what I, in that little nutshell that I just gave you. But it gives you a sense of, this isn't, it's not a question of morality, it's not a question of approval or disapproval, it's a question of what is. This is just what is. These people exist, and I think it's very important that we uh, take steps to provide quality of life for people, for all people. So, right, one of the reactions you may be familiar with is um, people tend to uh, have a very fearful reaction. Uh, if they don't understand sexual and gender diversity, then often the reaction that you get out of people is a, ah, you know, ah. Um, so I think it's important that we take a look at the kinds of reactions that end up causing problems for, for sexual and gender minorities. Um, heterosexism would be the first uh, and the main one, and that is the sense that heterosexuality is normal or superior to other, gen uh, to other sexual orientations. Right? Uh, and that could be a systemic heterosexism, like um, not allowing gay marriage, for example, because that's an inferior form of relationship, that's heterosexism. Or, or it can be one-on-one, -on -one, like a parent refusing to acknowledge the partner that their child has, for example. Cissexism would be the gender identity equivalent, the sense that Sharon's identity as a female is more valid than my identity as a male. So that cissexual gender identity is superior or more valid than a transgender gender identity. Monosexism, uh, that <laughs> I only just came across this term preparing the presentation. Which, which is the, the, um, the idea that both heterosexuality and homosexuality are superior to bisexuality. <laughs> I mean, come on, this is starting to get a little bit silly, right? But it exists. The sense that bisexuals just are confused, can't make up their minds, um, you get the picture. And, uh, and actually, this is more common than we might think. Genderism is the idea that there are only two genders, male and female, and that gender is based solely in biology. So this is the notion of your biological destiny. You're born a man, you will grow up to be masculine, and you'll love women, and you'll, you know, etc. Uh, and so it's the sense that transgender people are confused or mentally ill, that, or that intersex people are freaks of nature rather than part of natural variation that exists. And phobias. Homophobia, I think we're all familiar with that is, what that is. That is, uh, in a nutshell, the fear or hatred of gay or lesbian people. Um, and I don't, I don't like that description because when I have experienced homophobia, the people who have perpetrated acts of, of homophobia probably wouldn't say that they are afraid of gay people or that they hate gay people. My experience is it's much more subtle than that. It can certainly be outright fear and outright hatred, but I think that there's a subtlety that is overlooked, that the majority of homophobia that exists is, is far more subtle than, than what we would typically call fear or hatred. And it could be just uh, disapproval or giving somebody the evil eye or just something very subtle that somebody would say, oh, I'm not homophobic, I just don't like that whole idea. I don't want to think about that. This is homophobia. So the fear of hatred, I think, is just a little too simple to, to define it. But there it is. Biophobia is, by comparison, the fear of hatred of bisexuals. And also, then, transphobia, the fear of hatred of trans people. And one of the, thing that, one of the things that's interesting about these is that there are, it's hard to, to tell where one ends and the other begins, right? That if, if somebody has a, shouts a, a something hateful towards um, a gay man walking down the street, it may be because the gay man is, it has, is presenting in a very feminine way. It may be how they look if they have a, a male um, 
uh, acting in a feminine manner, that, that in a sense that's transphobia. Um, and likewise, if a trans woman is walking down the street and perceived to be a gay man and gets gay bashed, whereas really it's it's a, a trans woman, not a gay man, right? So they're really connected with, with people just not liking any kind of transgression of gender boundaries at all. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think it's kind of important that we debunk this whole idea of biological destiny. And I'm just going to read the quote here. One of the great myths of our culture is that at birth each infant can be identified as distinctly male or female, biological sex, will grow up to have correspondingly masculine or feminine behavior, public gender, live as a man or a woman, social gender role, and marry a woman or a man heterosexual orientation. This is not so. A significant number of people, in fact, do not fit the simple idea of biological gender destiny. So, let's take a look at sexual and gender spectrum. Because biological destiny thinks man, woman, right? Male, female, right? One side, two sides. But this is not how it works. In reality, each of these things is a spectrum. And there's more than one spectrum, so let's look at them. First, biological sex. When you are born, you are not born only male or female. There's a whole variety of conditions that exist in between the two extremes of fully male and fully female. And trust me, if you go looking into the intersex condition, it's amazing how much variation can occur biologically. So, it's, and it's, this isn't three points on a spectrum, I'll just make that very clear. You can find yourself at any point along that line. Uh, then there is your gender identity, your sense of yourself as a man, your sense of yourself as a woman, or whether you are somewhere closer to the middle, bi-gendered, both, genderless, neither, or third genders. Many cultures all around the world recognize at least three distinct genders. So we're kind of behind the times a little bit. Then there is your gender expression, socially, how you present yourself. Whether you present yourself in a very masculine manner, all the way through to the middle of androgyny, where it's kind of hard to tell, and then through to a very feminine expression. Your sexual orientation, again, just something completely separate. Whether you are exclusively attracted to women, or you are exclusively attracted to men, or whether you are bisexual, or asexual, both, neither, and anywhere along that spectrum. And distinct from all of these, again, is your sexual behavior. Your sexual orientation does not determine your sexual behavior. You could be a gay man who doesn't have uh, any sexual relationship, right? So you can, your sexual orientation does not define your sexual behavior. Anything from exclusively sex with women to exclusively sex with men to both or neither and anywhere along that spectrum. So, biological destiny would say, you're born a little boy, you grow up to feel like a man, you're gonna present really, you know, like Schwarzenegger, you're going, to, women are gonna love you, and you're gonna love them, and, well, I had to block that one out. Our <laughs> <laughs> likewise, born a female, you're gonna feel like a female, you are going to be real girly, and uh, men are gonna love you, and you're gonna love them, and again, uh, not for your eyes. Um, but this is not real reality, right? So there's the idea of biological gender destiny, and then there's reality. These are two different things. So for example, just show how easy it is to debunk this, we'll map me on this. I was born female, I had my genes tested just to make sure I'm definitely female, XX chromosomes. My gender identity is, like the film that was made about me, on the male side of middle. So, not quite the male, but just on the male side of it. My gender expression is just a little bit more masculine. I'm not the manliest of men, but I'm not the most effeminate either, that's for sure. Um, and I am exclusively attracted to women, and sexual behavior well, is none of your beeswax. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see, it's very hard to just put everybody on one side, everybody on the other side, and think that that's going to fit. It does. So, now we're just going to take a look at some statistics. I do not like statistics at all. Because there, I'm always hearing different ones. Which one's right? Where was the study? 
Who funded the study? Was it in Canada? Was it in the US? What was the year of it? What size was the group? So I'm just going to choose a few to give a snapshot of the lived experiences of sexual and gender minorities and to become, just to get an awareness of, of, of the reality of things. So if some of the numbers, you know, it's just a, just a nutshell, just a snapshot. So we're gonna look at mental health, physical health, sexual health, discrimination, and less depressing stuff. In mental health, let's see, sexual and gender minorities have higher rates of depression, often uh, about three times as high, uh, substance abuse, twice as high, uh, anxiety disorders and suicidality compared to heterosexual people. And as we go through a lot of this stuff, you'll get a sense of why. This is not out of the blue. The risk of suicide among lesbian, gay, bisexual youth is 4 to 14 times higher than for their heterosexual peers. I've also heard 6 to 16 times higher. I don't know if the number really matters. It's high. So we need to take this very seriously. Three out of four trans people have been suicidal, half have attempted suicide, and the actual suicide rate is as high as one in five. It's 20%. Um, and uh, the good news though is that treated transsexuals, so people like me who have had access to hormones and surgeries, the suicide rate drops from one in five to one in 100. So we don't know what causes transsexuality, we don't know what the best treatment for it is, but we know that that works. Bisexuals have higher rates of mental health issues and health service use than lesbians and gays. And this is very interesting because it's only recently that bisexuals have begun to be studied as a distinct group. So often they were lumped in uh, with lesbians and gays and bisexuals, right? <laughs> but they, they went, now that they're separating bisexuals into their own distinct group and studying them distinctly, they're shocked. The researchers I, I know some of them personally who have been spearheading a lot of this research, shocked to find the disparities between lesbian gays and bisexuals. Um, and we can go into it, you'll see it in a lot more cases of statistics, but bisexuals do have much higher rates of mental health issues. Um, they are often experience rejections from both hetero homosexuals and heterosexuals, right? It, there's, there's, there's a sense of, you're not one of us, from both sides. And isolation leads to problems, as you'll see. Sexual minority women are particularly at risk for substance-related disorders, while sexual minority men have a higher risk of suicide. I thought that was very interesting. This gives you a sense of how, depending on your, your sex, um, the different routes that people uh, will tend to take to escape from suffering. Over 80% of LGBT youth have reported verbal harassment at school. Physical attacks have been reported by 20% of lesbian, gay, bisexual youth and by 55% of trans youth. This is the reasons that we wear these bracelets. The Enough is Enough campaign that LGBT Lanark County has been spearheading to fight bullying, particularly against LGBT youth. All bullying is bad, but so much of it is directed towards LGBT youth. And it's very well documented. Physical health, 36% of LGBT people smoke compared to 16% generally, stress. Bisexuals report higher rates of smoking, 45%, and alcoholism than other sexual minorities. The highest of all sexual and gender minorities in terms of smoking and alcoholism is bisexuals. Gay men are more likely than straight men to experience eating disorders. Body image in the gay community is a real issue, right? Um, lesbians, by comparison, are more likely to be overweight or obese than heterosexual women. And that may be uh, the sense of, I don't have to worry about body image for men anymore. There's a freedom, right, that occurs. Whereas with men, there's a, a very strong focus on body image. So it's interesting to see those differences. Health disparities exist within LGBT populations due to a reluctance to seek medical attention. And I could go on forever on this one. I mean, people, uh, for example, trans people, you can start right there. Uh, trans men might not go in for pap smears uh, and uh, pelvic exams and breast exams. Late detection of cancers and late treatment of cancers leads to a much higher rate of deaths by cancer within trans communities. Likewise, a trans woman, 
uh, somebody born male but is a female, uh, may not go in for the prostate exams, right? And that leads to higher incidences of cancers and early deaths. Uh, also, uh, within the sexual minorities, there's a very strong reluctance to, to come out to doctors or to go to doctors, usually having had negative experiences in the past and not wanting, not being sure with my, whether I can talk to my doctors about things. It's very well documented that sexual and gender minorities are quite reluctant to seek medical attention, even for routine, routine exams. An Ontario study found that 25% of lesbians and gays and 58% of bisexuals are not out to their doctors. There's a very interesting report, it's called Systems Failure, um, and I highly recommend you taking a look at it. Uh, it was done in Ontario, and it takes a look at um, the failures in the health service system for sexual and gender minorities. And uh, it's easy to understand why so many people do not come up to their doctors. Um, a U.S. study found that 89% of lesbians and bisexual women reported a negative reaction when they came out to their doctor, and a study of U.S. medical students found 25% were strongly homophobic, in their words, and 9% viewed homosexuality as a mental disorder, which is absurd. This was recent, because it was declassified as a mental disorder in 1973. So why? Almost one in ten medical students still consider it classified as a me mental disorder is absurd. Absolutely absurd. There's no reason for that. There's a failure in the education of, of these students, if you ask me, in addition to other problems. Sexual health. This is shocking. Lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth often engage in early sexual behavior to prove that they're heterosexual, resulting in higher rates of pregnancy, sexually transmitted infections, than heterosexual youth. More lesbians and bisexual women are getting pregnant by accident than heterosexual females. How is this, how is this possible? What is wrong? This has been documented. Uh, misconceptions about safe sex practices and heterosexually oriented sex education increase the risk of unplanned pregnancies and the transmission of sexually transmitted infections. Education is so important. As a result, also as a result of poverty and unemployment, many trans women resort to prostitution and are often reluctant to negotiate condom use due to low self-esteem and fear of violence. Um, I read a report recently that was very, very shocking uh, about the HIV infection rates among trans female sex workers, and it is 27% compared to 4% among non-trans female sex workers. Unbelievably high. And it is self-esteem, right? And the fear of violence. Trans women are, as prostitutes are subjected to much greater violence than non-trans prostitutes. And this is so often overlooked, and it's a shame. Discrimination. Uh, just very quickly, there are different types of discrimination. Systematic discrimination would be on a systematic level, so something like where a whole group of people are denied rights and privileges that are afforded to the rest. So that would be like gay marriage, right? Thank goodness that is no longer an issue. Um, then there is unintentional discrimination, which is obviously unintended, but simply a failure to recognize that these people exist. So, um, for example, uh, many women's shelters, um, don't have any policies in place for how to integrate trans women. And they just, it's just not a problem, it's not going to happen. It's just a failure to recognize that there's this very large group of people who need access to services, for example, and it, there's no policies in place and they don't know what to do if it comes across their door and so they just reject them. Intentional discrimination would be the opposite, where discrimination happens but it was actually very much intended. So um, that might be uh, an example of that might be uh, women's festivals, for example, where they don't allow trans women uh, because there's a sense you are not a valid female. I do not recognize uh, you as a female, and so you are not allowed here. And that's discrimination based on perceiving a person very intentionally as, as being uh, inferior in a certain respect. Uh, then personal discrimination on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, it could be anything from um, you know, shouting slurs at somebody, or uh, the cashier at the um, 
grocery store giving you the evil eye kind of thing. It could be very subtle, it could be very blatant on a one-to-one -one basis. So there's many forms of discrimination that, that exist. Um, a third of trans people have lost or been denied a job because of their trans identity. Half of trans people live on less than 15000 a year. And that's not because they can't work. <laughs> Uh, the number of hate crimes in Canada are motivated by sexual orientation more than doubled from 2007 to 2008 and were the most violent of all hate crimes. So in case we think that some of this stuff is no longer an issue, why are we still harping on this? We need to. That's why. The minute we don't have to, we'll stop harping. 50% of lesbian and gay youth report parental rejection because of their sexual orientation. So again, you're wondering about why there's so much depression, and suicidality, and anxiety disorders. Well, rejection will do it, for one thing. And also, uh, 20 to 40 percent of homeless youth are, uh, are estimated to be lesbian, gay, bi, or trans. And 60 percent of those will resort to prostitution. Right. So, all of these things play a role, and everything's connected. Less depressing stuff, though. <coughs> is that we rock. Okay? <laughs> International, that's all I have to say about it. The people that I know, lesbian, gay, bi, trans people, are some of the best people that I know. It's not that all of the best people I know are LGBT, but all the LGBT people that I know are among the best people that I know. It does something to you when you have to overcome something, when you have experienced suffering and have had to fight for quality of life, have had to fight for acceptance, have had to fight for your family, right? It, it makes a stronger person out of you, and it makes a better person out of you. And I wouldn't wish these experiences on anybody, but if they happen, you grow stronger. And it's a weird little side effect. So, personally, I love LGBT people. <laughs> so, strategies for change. I, there's so many. There's, Recognize that we rock. Number one. <laughs> We're not all these weird freaks of nature kind of thing. We are awesome people. We are excellent people. Uh, it's been proven that support from family and friends, positive responses to coming out, and identifying with the LGBT community reduces stress, contributes to positive mental health, reduces the risk of substance abuse, and significantly reduces internalized homophobia and transphobia. So, all that said, there's no reason whatsoever to deny anybody support, to withhold a positive response from somebody when they come out, or to, to create barriers to people accessing a, a greater community of people who are like them. Because as, as Rainbow Health Ontario, uh, which is a really great organization that exists, they say that with understanding the effects of minority stress, um, this is not just a political issue, it's a health issue. If we want healthy people, mentally and physically, we need to take this stuff seriously. Uh, we need to ensure that service providers, teachers, parents, and everybody else are respectful, informed, self-aware, and non-judgmental. There's no reason to judge. No. But what matters is quality of life. And that how to, how to make, there's all kinds of people working towards these things, but it's, it's there. It's a strategy for change. It's important. Uh, we need to encourage inclusive sexual health discussions. So not just about the heterosexual sexual education kind of thing, but representing the, the diversity that actually exists. And with an emphasis on self-esteem. This is so important. It is such a critical factor in, in sexual health. Intimacy. Discussing int intimacy is part of it. Not just a physical thing, but, a, but emotional, psychological intimacy is very important. Uh, sexually transmitted infections, uh, and also pregnancy risks, and the many forms of abuse. Um, and this, I can go on talking forever about this one too. Uh, like the, uh, in the systems failure report that I read, uh, one woman, a lesbian woman, uh, her, her story was that, you know, she goes into the doctor and the doctor says, so do you need birth control? And her answer is no. And the doctor says, okay, move on to the next subject. Because that, then the doctor has made the assumption that this person is not sexually active. So unless this lesbian woman interrupts and says, well, wait a minute, let me explain to you 
and out yourself when already feeling like this isn't a safe place to out yourself because this doctor clearly doesn't even think of the possibility of any other type of sexual relationship, right? And so that woman would not have gotten education about sexually transmitted infections um, at, or, <laughs> or also with pregnancy risk, you could have a, a bisexual woman, for example, but if she's with a man, or if she's with a woman, then the doctor might assume that she's gay. And so there's no need to discuss pregnancy risks. But bisexual youth are getting pregnant at a higher rate than heterosexual youth. So we need to really be conscious of, 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 of the risks, and, and it needs to be inclusive, these kinds of discussions. Open-ended questions, open discussions. And of course, the many forms of abuse, often there's a sense that within lesbian or gay relationships, there isn't abuse. But there is, and quite a lot of it. And because a lot of lesbian and gay people feel the need to defend their relationship, my relationship is valid, and they had to defend it, defend it, then often there's a reluctance to come out and say I'm being abused by my partner. Or to go in and report abuse, a gay man going reporting abuse of a male, from a male partner to, in a police station could be a very fearful prospect, right? So it's important that these kinds of things be taken out of the closet completely. No assumptions, because you just don't know. Uh, respectful questions, inclusive language, uh, room for ambiguity. So for example, uh, if you're a service provider of any kind and you want to ask about a person's partner, you don't say, so how, you know, how's your relationship with your husband? You can say, how's your relationship with your partner? Because the minute you use, well, the minute you reveal a heterosexual bias in your questioning, you've already created an environment in which the person will not will feel unsafe about correcting you and outing themselves. Right? So, using language that is not heterosexual specific is very important. Um, and not making assumptions, like if somebody comes in and talks about a same-sex partner, that doesn't mean that they're exclusively same-sex oriented, or that, that it reflects what their sexual behavior might be, right? Or if somebody comes in and says, I'm a lesbian, but there may be uh, some circumstance in which there could be a sexual relationship with a man, because sexual behavior being distinct from sexual orientation, right? So, you have to be very careful not to make assumptions about people. And room for ambiguity, because for goodness sake, you know, somebody might, we just don't know, and there's, we don't want to have to box people in and say, oh, okay, you know, somebody says, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm gender confused. You don't want to necessarily say, oh, then that means you must be a trans person, and you're going to want to transition in this and that, and put them into a box. It's okay if people are gender confused, and that's just where they're at. Or if they're questioning, and that's just where they're at. We have such a desire to box and to understand and say, this is your label, kind of thing. And it's important not to. Not to do that. And finally, be good. <laughs> it, that, that's it in a nutshell. I could have left all the rest of them out. But in case that's a little complicated about what that actually means, I've just done a little diagram here of what being good is. So there are negative levels of attitude and positive levels of attitude. So everything from repulsion, that's the ugliest, through to pity, through to tolerance, through to acceptance. Okay but then into support, and admiration, and appreciation, and finally, best of all, nurturance. So, if you ask me, this can be made much simpler. <laughs> this is a much simpler way of looking. This is being good, nurturing people, bringing out the best in them, going beyond acceptance, going beyond admiring, oh, you've overcome quite a bit, that's really awesome, and things like that. And, oh, appreciate it, yeah, I can sort of, you know, but, uh, and then skip all of the rest, and nurture people, because we want to bring out the best out of people. And it benefits everybody to do that. And there's no reason not to. And that's my conclusion. Mm -hmm.